Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman history. Nikephorus the Logothete is said to have been descended from Jabala of Ghassan, the royal line of the Arabian Ghassanids. He, or one of his relatives, may have settled in Pisidia in the Eastern Roman Empire. Nikephorus himself was born in Seleucia. He was an older man, perhaps 50 years old when he became emperor, and had been Logothete of the Genicon during the reign of Irene the Athenian. He became emperor on the 31st of October 802. Immediately, upon becoming emperor and interrogating Irene about the whereabouts of her treasury, Nikephorus I established a tribunal at the Mangana Palace to deal with financial law cases, greatly improving the execution of justice in the empire and rooted out corruption. The emperor also cancelled the financial policies of Empress Irene by reimposing tariffs on trade goods and cancelling her tax reliefs. Not long after taking power, the former Empress Irene was implicated along with her eunuch Aetius in a plot against Nikephorus I to restore her to power. The emperor reacted by having her banished to the island of Lesbos. Nikephorus dismissed Aetius from his command but was otherwise spared because he had helped conceal the emperor's coup from their former sovereign. Earlier, in AD 802, the emperor Charlemagne sent ambassadors to Constantinople to arrange a marriage between the emperor and the empress Irene. When the Frankish and papal diplomats arrived, Irene had been ousted by Nikephorus I, who was now left to deal with them. He ignored Charlemagne's title of emperor, and diplomacy focused on the Eastern Roman territories in Italy, such as Phoenicia, Dalmatia, and Italy. The Frankish ambassadors returned to the West the following year. In 806, Nikephorus I prevented Patriarch Nikephorus I from sending his synodical letters to the Pope, because the Pope had crowned Charlemagne Emperor, and more significantly, the Pope supported Theodore of Studios in his dispute with the emperor. Relations between the Christian West and the Christian East remained uneasy for Nikephorus I's reign. Once the eunuch Aetius had been dismissed, the emperor appointed Bardanes Turkos as monostrategos of the Asiatic Thebes. In 803, the Arabs demanded the payment of tribute from the emperor, which he refused to pay. Turkos called a meeting of his forces to discuss the impending Arab retaliatory offensive. However, his dissatisfied troops proclaimed him emperor on the 19th of July, AD 803. Their cause was the restoration of the Empress Irene to power. Among Turkos's officers were three junior officers, Leo the Armenian, Michael the Amorian, and Thomas the Slav. Bardanes marched from the Anatolicon theme to Chrysopolis, but his rebellion soon floundered, when Irene died on the 9th of August, 803. Her body was buried at her monastery on the island of Principo. With the main symbol of his rebellion dead, Turkos's army started deserting en masse, with the Armenia Con having sided with Nikephorus I, as well as the young officers Leo the Armenian and Michael the Amorian, both of whom would become emperor in the succeeding 20 years. Turkos, seeing the writing on the wall, surrendered, and fled his headquarters at Malagina in Bithynia to a monastery he founded on the island of Prote, where he became a monk. The supporters of the rebellion were punished with property confiscations, and all the themes involved had their pay suspended for the year. So much for Turkos. The rebellion meant there was no one to stop the caliphate's army from raiding the frontiers and freeing prisoners. Nikephorus I and Harun al-Rashid, the caliph, negotiated a peace treaty in exchange for reintroducing the tribute Irene had paid of 160,000 nomismata for that year. To secure the succession, the emperor crowned his son Storakios as co-emperor in December 803. In 804, Lycaonian agents who supported Nikephorus I descended upon Bardanes Turkos on Prote and blinded him to permanently remove him as a threat. Nikephorus I denied responsibility and made an effort to find and punish the perpetrators. On the 20th of December, 807, 
Starachios, after an imperial bride show, married Theophano, a relative of the former Empress Irene, thus connecting his family to the previous regime. In August 804, Harun al-Rashid launched an attack through the Cilician gates to ravage the Anatolikon theme. The emperor commanded the army in person to challenge their advance, but after receiving word of trouble in Constantinople, he turned his army round. On their return journey, the Arabs ambushed the Eastern Roman army at the Battle of Crassos in Phrygia and was soundly beaten. Altabari says that some 40,700 Romans were slain, captured 4,000 pack animals, and nearly captured the emperor himself, were it not for the bravery of his officers. Even so, he was still wounded three times. However, the losses, though the exact figure is probably an exaggeration, did not cripple the Byzantine defences, and in 805, the caliph arranged a truce with the emperor to face an internal revolt. At the Lamis River, 3,700 Arab prisoners were exchanged for Roman POWs, and the emperor rebuilt the castra at Ancyra, Thrabassa, and Andrasos. The re-establishment of peace in the east allowed imperial foreign policy to focus on the Balkans. The Strategos of Hellas, Scleros, undertook a successful campaign against the Slavs in the Peloponnese. Once the Romans had subdued all opposition in the peninsula, the descendants of refugees that fled the area two centuries before were resettled in places such as Patras, as described by the Chronicle of Monimvasia. One of these governors, a native of Lesser Armenia, and a member of the family called Scleroi, came into hostile blows with the Slavic tribes, conquered and obliterated them completely, and enabled the ancient inhabitants to recover their own. When the aforementioned Emperor Nicephorus heard these things, he was filled with joy and became anxious to renew the cities there, to rebuild the churches that the barbarians had destroyed, and to Christianize the barbarians themselves. And for this reason, having inquired about the colony where the people of Patras lived, he had them re-established by his order, together with their own shepherd, whose name at that time was Athanasius, on their ancient soil. From 805 to 806, in the east, the Armenia Con besieged Melitini, and the Anatolicon attacked Tarsus, and the Cypriots rebelled against the Arabs, who governed the island jointly with the empire as a demilitarized zone and accepted imperial rule. This was an attempt by Nicephorus I to expand the frontier in the east. In 806, the venerable patriarch Tarasius died and was replaced by a bureaucrat called Nicephorus. The same man had written the short history in the old classical style. The emperor and patriarch rehabilitated Joseph of Cathara as a priest, and later made him keeper of Hagia Sophia. He had previously been defrocked for presiding over the marriage of Constantine VI and Theodote. Nicephorus gave this priest a second chance because he had been responsible for persuading Bardanes Turcos to retire, and was a very helpful ally of the emperor. Theodore of Studios was disgusted that not only had he not been chosen as patriarch, but also the controversial Joseph of Cathara had returned. Plato, Theodore's uncle, had threatened to lead the church into schism if a layman was selected, which got them both arrested. Theodore and Plato were released after Nicephorus was selected, but they ceased receiving communion with the patriarch. The emperor Nicephorus appointed Theodore's brother, Joseph, as Archbishop of Thessalonica to placate the malcontent monks, but to no effect. For all intents and purposes, the shadow of the Mokian schism had returned. Between late 805 and 807, further Eastern Roman forays were conducted between the Romans and Arabs. Harun al-Rashid assembled the largest force ever sent against the eastern frontier, consisting of 135,000 troops. Meanwhile, an Arab fleet raided Cyprus and carried off 16,000 prisoners. Nicephorus personally led his forces to pick off small Arab detachments, but avoided the main army. A truce was brokered in 807, 
with the Emperor paying 30,006 Nomis Mata for peace. Nikifors I promised not to re-fortify destroyed forts, and Cyprus was returned to its previous power-sharing status. But Harun was required to abandon Tyana. Both sides agreed, and the eastern frontier grew quiet until 811. In 804, the Dukes of Venetia, Obelarius and Beatus, ousted their predecessor and seized control of the Ducate. The pair then dispatched a fleet to subdue the Dukes of Dalmatia. In 806, Obelarius and Beatus asked Charlemagne to become their overlord and assigned Venetia and Dalmatia to his son, Pepin. The Emperor Nikiforus had to respond to this rebellion by secessionists. In 807, Nikitas the Patrician, a proven commander as Strategos of Sicily, was dispatched to restore order. Nikitas then blockaded the Venetian coast. The Dukes of Venetia even joined the Romans in their efforts, rediscovering their loyalty to Constantinople. Pepin and the Dukes came to a peace arrangement with Nikitas. Venetia was returned to imperial control, and Beatus was sent to Constantinople as a hostage. But Oblarius was left as Duke of Venetia and granted the rank of Spatharius. Nikephorus released Beatus and granted him the rank of consul. With the east and the Adriatic secured, Nikephorus I refocused his efforts on the Balkans. In 807, he personally led an army to Adrianople, but stopped when he learned of a plot against him by elements of his tagmata. The conspirators were arrested, whipped, and exiled with their property being also confiscated. The emperor returned to Constantinople, but the Strategos of Macedonia and his troops continued westward to harry the Slavs. Meanwhile, the Arabs found out that Nikiforos I had ignored their treaty and rebuilt the destroyed forts. A 10,000 strong Arab force was sent against the Romans, but the Anatolikon had blocked the pass at the Cilician gates. When the Arabs tried to force their way through, the Anatolikon won a resounding victory, inflicting heavy casualties and killing the Arabs' commander. Harun reoccupied Tarsus, Germaniakia, and Adata, and sent a 30,000 strong army into Anatolia. Nikiforos I fought the Arabs in battle, but no side won a decisive victory, and both subsequently withdrew. An Arab fleet was sent to the Peloponnese and fomented a Slavic revolt, as well as attacked Rhodes and the city of Myra. However, the Arab fleet was sunken by a storm. The Strategos of Hellas was also able to crush the Slavic revolt. The emperor did not need to pay any tribute and had rebuilt his forts. In 807 to 808, the Eastern Romans had established control of the old city of Serdica, greatly extending the Balkan frontier established by Irene. A new defensive line consisting of Serdica, Philippopolis, Irenopolis, Marcali, and Anchialus marked the territory between the Eastern Roman Empire and the Bulgar Khanate. While not explicitly stated, the Byzantines had also gained full control over mainland Greece and the Strymon Valley. The local strategoi were probably responsible for these annexations. Part of this was due to the increase in the size of the Balkan armies from some 3,000 to 12,000. To fill these empty lands, the quaestor Bardanios Animas was dispatched to round up refugees and foreigners and settled them in the theme of Macedonia as taxpaying farmers. In February 808, a conspiracy was discovered planning to make the quaestor Arsaba the Patrician, Emperor, and involved many officials, bishops and monks. Nikiforos I had Arsaba whipped, and once he was tonsured as a monk, he was exiled to Bithynia. The rest of the conspirators were lashed, and then banished with the confiscation of their property. When the emperor demanded the rogue monks of Studios to accept communion, and they refused, he had them condemned in a church council and exiled. In 809, Eastern Roman forces continued to expand in the Balkans against the Sclavonii. The Khan of the Bulgars, Krum, was alarmed by the progress of Roman troops in his southern border. He assembled his forces and surrounded an army in the Strymon Valley, while the Roman strategoi were distributing wages. Vanquishing the Eastern Roman army, 
the Bulgars then proceeded to Serdica and sacked it, killing 6,000 soldiers and many other civilians. The emperor responded immediately and marched to Pliska, the Bulgar capital, and occupied it, spending Easter there. The Eastern Romans moved to Serdica, where the emperor ordered his troops to rebuild the town. However, they mutinied, because they had not been paid and were the elite tagmata. This was a job worthy of theme soldiers. The emperor abandoned the project, restored the army to order, and returned to Constantinople, where the ringleaders of the mutiny were exiled or demoted. In the west, the Archon of Cephalonia, with his small fleet, attacked Comachio, but was repelled by the Franks. The fleet withdrew to Dalmatia. The Emperor Nikiforos I responded to the threats to the Balkan and Adriatic provinces with a program of reform, commonly referred to as the Vexations of Nikiforos I. Started in September 809 and were completed by Easter 810, Nikiforos I issued edicts and implemented policies, making them one of the most comprehensive sets of changes in Byzantine history. Firstly, he removed large numbers of people from Thrace and Anatolia and moved them to Greece and Macedonia, forcing these families from the first to the third generation to sell their estates and any property they could not take with them. The property was given to the government and sold off. They were then moved and settled on new lands assigned to them. His second vexation reformed the theme system, enlisting poor men into the army and extending the burden of provisioning them from just their immediate family to the whole village community. In joint liability, village communities would pay 18 and a half nomismata for the soldiers' equipment and provisions, and also pay for their taxes. The third measure was to begin a new census, the first conducted since Leo III over 70 years before, raising two karatia per man for the administrative cost. Treadgold has conjectured that this measure was started in 807 at the beginning of the indiction cycle and completed in 809. The fourth vexation was that all tax exemptions were cancelled. These targeted all of Irene's tax exemptions as well as those made by previous rulers. Nikiforos's fifth measure was to extend the half tax, or kapnikon, to paroikoi that were tenants under religious institutions such as imperial monasteries, churches, and hostels. These charities and institutions were also transferred to the imperial domain and taxed accordingly. The sixth policy was to make it a duty of the strategoi to enforce treasure trove, which, under Justinianic law, prescribed that the discovered treasure should be divided between the owner of the land and the discoverer. Now Strategoi were to take a cut of the treasure of the state treasury. The next vexation was similar and stated that anyone who had discovered a hoard in the last twenty years was to surrender it to the fisc. The eighth vexation dealt with inheritances that left people below the 50 solidi poverty threshold. If a poor person received a divided inheritance from their father or grandfather, they had to pay taxes on that land for 20 years. Additionally, anyone buying household slaves outside of the major slave markets of Abydos and the Dodecanese were to pay a tariff of two nomismata per slave. The Ninth Edict required all shipowners that lived on the coasts, especially around Asia Minor, whom were not farmers, to purchase a piece of land from those seized by the government for a price set by them. The last vexation was that all of the major shipowners of Constantinople were given a loan of £12 of gold, or 864 Normus Marta, at a rate of 16.67% interest. It is possible that shipowners did not have to take the loans, but if they did, the government expected to make considerable profit on the interest. Furthermore, he rewarded poorer people for informing on the wealthy that tried to dodge paying taxes or breaking the law. The Chronicle of Monimvasia was highly praiseworthy of Nikiforos I because of his recolonization of Greece, which was a complete success. The reforms of Nikiforos I did not end there. 
In addition to these policies, he created four new themes in the West. The Peloponnesian theme, which had Armenians, Thracians, and many others, including Mardiites, settle in the area, and was converted into a naval theme, including the whole of the Peloponnese, with its capital at Corinth. The theme of Hellas was strengthened and extended into Boeotia and southern Thessaly, with its capital at Athens. The Archontate of Cephalonia was reorganized into a theme and now included the region of Epirus, strengthening the maritime province. The Archontate of Thessalonica was also reorganized into a theme that covered northern Thessaly, southern Macedonia, and Thessalonica itself. Moreover, as well as themes, the emperor created a new tagma, the Hikonatoi, with 4,000 cavalry drawn from the sons of existing officers. In 810, the Dukes of Venetia switched allegiance to King Pepin of Italy and invited him to take control of the area. With the capital of Venetia, Malamocho, secured, Pepin then sent the Frankish fleet to raid Dalmatia. Meanwhile, the Venetian loyalists fled to the island of Rialto, which Pepin subsequently besieged. The Strategos of Cephalonia arrived in Dalmatia with the newly expanded and reorganized thematic fleet of that province and regained control of Dalmatia, with the Ducate likely being reorganized into an Archontate with a governor from Constantinople, as well as more soldiers and staff. This show of force was enough for Pepin to withdraw from Venetia. The Dukes Oblerius and Beatus were arrested and exiled, the former fleeing to the court of Charlemagne. Agnellus Paticiacus was appointed as Duke, and the capital of Venetia was moved from Malamocho to Rialto, which quickly developed into the city of Venice. Nicephorus I enacted more reforms. Theophanes says that Nicephorus I issued more edicts, saying, In this year, Nicephorus extended his designs against the Christians by way of an ungodly control over the purchase of all kinds of animals, cattle and produce. The unjust confiscations and fines imposed upon prominent persons and the exaction of interest on ships, he who issued laws against usury, and a thousand other evil inventions. On the 1st of October, there was an attempt on Nikiphoros I's life, but was prevented by two messengers who were with the emperor. In February 811, the Arabs attacked without warning and sacked the capital of the Armeniacon theme, Eukiata. Leo the Armenian, the Strategos, managed to escape, but the garrison was slaughtered, and the annual pay for the Armeniacon, 93,600 nomis martyr, was captured by the Arabs. Leo was flogged and exiled for this blunder, with the capital of the province changing to Amasia. Having crushed much of his western enemies, Nikiforos I assembled all of the Tagmata and most of the theme soldiers from Anatolia for a massive invasion of the Bulgar Khanate. The expedition was well funded and organized, with Sophulis proposing that the army assembled was somewhat around 20,000 men, which included a large number of noblemen, granting the expedition a certain amount of ceremonial symbolism. The emperor marshaled his forces and left Constantinople in May 811. Khan Krum sent diplomats to sue for peace, but Nikiforos I refused. The army marched into Bulgaria, heading towards Pliska, the capital of Bulgaria. The Bulgar army was away mopping up the remnants of the Avar Khaganate at the time, and so Nikiforos I met very little opposition. This was helped by his employing feints so that the Bulgars did not know from where the Imperial army would strike, preventing Bulgar resistance from concentrating until it was too late. The Bulgars could not stop the Byzantine advance in Pliska, and so they decided to regroup in the mountains where they would be safe. Nevertheless, Pliska was protected by a garrison of 12,000 troops. The Byzantines overwhelmed the defences of Pliska and put every Bulgar soldier to the sword. Krum then sent an army of supposedly 50,000 men to defeat the Byzantines, but Nikiforos' army prevailed and annihilated them. A possible solution to working out this campaign is that the Chronicle of 811 refers to two Bulgar armies met by two different Byzantine columns 
in their march by separate routes to the Bulgar capital. One of them, the largest, made up of mainly lightly armed Slavs, may have been encountered by the column marching along the coast, while part of the elite force, which was trusted with the defence of the capital, remained in the environs of Pliska, where the Byzantine forces had been reunited before launching their main assault. Nikiforus I occupied Crum's palace, and his soldiers put the rest of the inhabitants to the sword, though the archaeology suggests that the inhabitants escaped, and actually the Chronicle of 811 is far more accurate than the hocus-pocus narrative talked about in Theophanes. The Chronicle of 811 does not mention a massacre. Instead, the emperor distributed the spoils from the ransacked city to his troops, based on the muster rolls, and punished those troops found looting and breaking discipline. He then opened the cellar of Crum's palace for his men to enjoy. Nikiforus sent messengers to Constantinople informing them of his victory, and the good qualities displayed by his son, Starachios. Nikiforus decided to return to Pliska the next year, and build a new city, named after himself, the next step in returning the frontier to the Danube River. Once the army was ready to leave, Crum's palace and the city walls were burned, something supported by significant archaeological evidence. With their mission accomplished, the army began to march to Serdica, and also received an offer of peace from Crum again, which Nikiforos similarly refused. However, Crum had now succeeded in lulling the Byzantines into a false sense of security. The emperor's next aim was to re-fortify the devastated stronghold. The Romans pillaged the countryside as they went to cause as much destruction as possible and cripple Crum's ability to retaliate. At this point, the senior commanders and Storakios asked the emperor to return to Constantinople and end the campaign instead of march to Serdica the enemy having seemingly been totally defeated, but he refused. On the 25th of July, 811, Crum assembled whatever warriors he had left, as the Chronicle of 811 says. They hired the Avars and neighbouring Sclaveneers, arming even the women like men. Crum and his motley crew waited for the Roman army to pass into a river valley in the Balkan mountains. The Roman army stopped and made camp in the valley, sending scouts to see what was ahead. The pass was blocked by a palisade, but the emperor was not alarmed since he thought it was a defence to prevent enemies entering Bulgaria, rather than a trap for his army. The Eastern Roman army had no clue they had walked into a trap, and instead went to bed. In the early morning on the 26th of July, 811, the Bulgars attacked. The Bulgars struck the centre of the Byzantine column and killed Emperor Nikiforus, who was with the Roman vanguard. Resistance melted away, with the Roman army fleeing in panicked chaos. Thousands ran, stampeding over each other into boggy marshlands and assaulting the barricade. The carnage is vividly described by the Chronicle of 811. When they resisted, only for a short while, without effect, many were slaughtered, and the others who saw this gave themselves to flight. At this same place, there was also a river that was very swampy and difficult to cross. When they did not immediately find a ford to cross the river, pursued by the enemy, they threw themselves into the river, entering with their horses and not being able to get out. They sank into the swamp and were trampled by those coming from behind. And some men fell on the others, so that the river was so full of men and horses that the enemies crossed on top of them, unharmed, and pursued the rest who, as was reasonable, thought they had come through safely. Here, therefore, all the patricians and other commanders fell. Those who thought they had escaped from the carnage of the river came up against the fence that the Bulgars had constructed, which was strong and exceedingly difficult to cross. Since they were not able to break through it with their horses, they abandoned their horses, and, having climbed up with their own hands and feet, hurled themselves headlong on the other side. But there was a deep excavated trench on the other side, so that those who hurled themselves from the top broke their limbs. 
Some of them died immediately, while the others progressed a short distance, but did not have the strength to walk, but fell to the ground and died tormented by hunger and thirst. In other places, men set fire to the fence, and when the bonds burned through and the fence collapsed above the trench, those fleeing were unexpectedly thrown down and fell into the pit of the trench of fire, both themselves and their horses. Thousands of Eastern Roman soldiers, officers, and non-combatants were killed, wounded, or missing. The emperor was dead and his son had been mortally wounded. Crum famously is said to have turned the emperor's dead skull into a drinking cup, which he used to serve Roman ambassadors visiting his court. The Battle of Plisca was the worst military disaster suffered by the Eastern Roman Empire since the Battle of Adrianople, and yet this colossal disaster had been preceded by a highly successful and well-organised campaign. Nikephorus I, if one reads the Chronicle of Theophanes, was something close to the devil himself, but every page of his chronicle shows all the achievements and deeds he accomplished in his nine-year reign, even though they are mired in poppycock and slander. Yet others, such as Methodius and the Chronicle of Monimvasia, show that George Syncellus and Theophanes' opinion was not universal. Niavis assessed Nikephorus I in the following way. There is not much point in speculating as to what would have happened if Nikephorus survived in 811. The Emperor Nikephorus was able to identify and tackle most of the basic problems facing the Empire. No department of state or sector of imperial interest was left neglected. Indeed, he proceeded to take measures in fields which his predecessors, and his successors too, rarely thought about, let alone dared to tackle. It appears that a determination to rule effectively marked his reign. His understanding of what constituted effective rule was forged during his time as a civil servant. He placed the concerns of the Byzantine administration at the heart of government, in much the same way as that other civil servant who became emperor, Anastasius. He concentrated in his hands every sort of power, but it seems that as a result, the imperial machine worked properly. He had the ability to control all the departments of the state in a more or less harmonious way. His prudence became a byword. There were dangers, of course. After his death, there was nobody with the ability to take his place at the centre of affairs. Nikephorus was perhaps unique among Byzantine emperors in that he attempted a concerted reform of most aspects of Byzantine government. Change in the administration, as J.B. Bury long ago observed, was the result of a gradual series of modifications. It was usual to improvise and adapt the machinery of government rather than to carry out any thoroughgoing reform. Nikephorus's reforms may have laid the foundations for Byzantium's period of greatness for the middle of the 9th century, but they also earned him great unpopularity. The son of the Logotheti of the Genicon, come Emperor, Nikephorus I. Storakios was a young man when his father became Emperor in 802. Since on his father's coins he was never depicted with a beard, it is likely he was still a teenager when he became sole emperor in 811. His sister Procopia was married to a nobleman called Michael Rangabi, who was promoted to the rank of Kurapalates. On Christmas Day 803, Storakios was crowned as co-emperor and Nikephorus's heir. In December 807, Nikephorus arranged a bride show to provide his son with a suitable wife selecting Theophano, a relative of the Empress Irene, which united his house with the former imperial dynasty. In 808, Nikephorus and Starachios campaigned in the Balkans, probably more to introduce his son to military life than anything strategic other than overseeing the conquest of Upper Thrace. Starachios then accompanied his father and half-brother in the fateful Plisca campaign in 811, where, despite the general success of the campaign, defeating two large Bulgar armies and sacking their capital of Plisca, the entire Eastern Roman army was destroyed 
and Starachios was left mortally wounded. The now sole emperor Starachios retreated with the remains of the army to the stronghold of Adrianople. The emperor had suffered a spinal injury and had blood in his stool, leaving him paralysed from the waist down. The magister Theoctistos and others urged Michael Rangabi to take the throne instead, since he was unharmed. But Michael refused out of loyalty to Nikephoros and Storakios. Then, the two most important surviving officers, Theoctistos and Stephen, Domesticos of the Scoli, proclaimed Storakios as emperor. On the 28th of July, 811, Storakios addressed the troops at Adrianople, and in a speech, he criticised his father for rejecting his advice at Pliska to break out of the valley at all costs, a move which might have preserved the army. After this speech, the army announced their support for Emperor Storakios. I would like to thank my generous patrons for their support, and if you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe for more content about the late Roman and Byzantine Empire. Stay notified using the bell, and now let us continue. Storakius prioritised establishing his authority and arranging for the succession. The patriarch Nikiforos asked for the money collected by the emperor Nikiforos from the church to be returned. Storakius refused and said he could only return 300 pounds of gold, some 21,600 nomismata in instalments. Procopia, the sister of Storakius, wanted her husband Michael to become emperor. However, Storakius' wife, Theophano, thought that she should become empress like her relative, Irene. Storakius stalled for time, but that was not a luxury he had. Rumours spread in the capital that Procopia was poisoning Storakius, and finally in September, Storakius named Theophano as his heir. Most of Storakius' officials did not agree and sided with Michael. On the evening of the 1st of October, 811, Storakius summoned Stephen, Domesticos of the Scoli, and asked him to arrest Michael and blind him. The Domesticos asked the emperor to wait because the palace of the Mangana, where Michael lived, was too well guarded and defensible. Stephen left after being sworn to secrecy. He summoned the Tagmata, top ministers, and Michael Rangabi to the Hippodrome and organised a coup. At dawn the following day, they proclaimed Michael as emperor. Storakius heard the proclamation and summoned his relative, Simeon the monk, who helped Storakius abdicate and become a monk. The patriarch, emperor and empress came to the palace to explain that the coup happened out of concern for Storakius. The former emperor said in response, You will not find in him a better friend. The Empress Theophano also retired to a monastery and became a nun. On the 11th of January, 812, Storakius died of gangrene from his wound and was buried in the Braca Monastery. Michael I was an educated man with a son, Theophylact, and broad support from the church, civil service and army when he was proclaimed emperor and ousted Storakios. Through his wife, Procopia, he was the son-in-law of Nikiforos I and the brother-in-law of Storakios. He released Nikiforos I's exiles, such as Theodore and Plato of the Studios Monastery and the various mutineers of his reign. Michael also handed out gifts to anyone who asked for them. Leo the Armenian, the former Strategos of the Armeniacon theme, was recalled from exile and appointed as Strategos of the Anatolicon theme. Leo soon won some victories over Arab raiding parties in the east. I would like to thank my generous patrons for their support, and if you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe for more content about the late Roman and Byzantine Empire. Stay notified using the bell, and now let us continue. The patriarch Nikiforos, the historian, asked the emperor to help him convert the Athigans and Politians. The Athingans were Christians that followed several Jewish practices and were considered heretics by the church. More modern research has suggested that they were possibly gypsies from India, but more definitely a group held in suspicion by ordinary Romans 
with heterodox practices. Athiganoi literally means untouchables. The Paulicians were dualists who believed the God in the Old Testament was evil. Michael I started having members of these religious minorities executed. The horrified Theodore demanded he stop his persecution to let them have time to repent. Michael I also recognised Charlemagne as an emperor rather than just king, but not emperor of the Romans. He also asked to arrange a marriage between his son Theophylact and one of Charlemagne's daughters. Michael I also asked the Pope to suggest a resolution over the matter of Joseph of Caffara. The Franks were very pleased at the recognition of Charlemagne's imperial title. In exchange, he recognised Eastern Roman possession of Istria and Venetia. The Pope found in favour of the Studite monks to defrock Joseph, ending the Mokian schism once and for all. In 812, Crum, Khan of the Bulgar Khanate, attacked Delvatus in Thrace. He had consolidated his forces, and with the catastrophic defeat of the Eastern Roman army in the previous year, was emboldened to go on the offensive. Michael I led his troops to Delvatus, but it was captured by Crum before he arrived. The Emperor's soldiers were shocked at the lax way Michael had organised the campaign, and mutinied, and some Tagma soldiers even proclaimed the long-suffering sons of Constantine V, blind, ordained and exiled in Athens, as emperors. Michael I had these renegade Tagmata dismissed from the service. Additionally, refugees from Thrace started fleeing in droves as the Bulgars advanced. The Khan captured most of the territory in Thrace, conquered by Irene and Nikiforos I. He then offered a truce to Michael I. Crum also demanded that the emperor hand over Bulgar deserters. One faction at court, including the patriarch and several important bishops, wanted to accept the peace treaty and hand over the refugees, whereas another faction, led by Theodore, the abbot of Studios, and several members of the Senate wanted to refuse the offer and continue the war. Michael I supported this latter faction. Crum captured and sacked Mesembria, massacring all of those who did not renounce Christianity. Michael made no effort to retake the city. In February 813, Crum invaded the empire again, but was ambushed by Roman troops led by Michael I, but the Bulgars quickly recovered. By May, Michael I had assembled soldiers from all the themes to avenge the fall of Mesembria. The inhabitants of Constantinople and the Empress exhorted the army to fight bravely before returning home. However, Michael I, now with a substantial army, did not know what to do with it, and wasted the whole month marching around Thrace, allowing their supplies to run low. In June, Crum returned with a small army and encamped at Versanicia, where the Eastern Roman army was. History repeated itself as Constantine VI had led troops to a standoff at Versanicia over a decade before. However, when Michael divvered for 15 days in the heat of summer, John Aplakis, commander of the Thracian and Macedonian troops, lost his patience and told the emperor that he would attack on the 22nd of June. Michael and his other officers agreed. When the day of battle came, Aplakis led his forces forward and charged into the Bulgars. However, Michael hesitated, and so Aplakis' attack was unsupported by the rest of the Eastern Roman army. The Bulgar cavalry encircled Aplakis and his men, and were cut down as they fell back. The rest of the army, demoralised from poor leadership, low supplies and exhausting but pointless marches, broke and fled. While Leo the Armenian, who commanded the other wing of the army, was later blamed for betraying Michael I and retreating, what seems to have happened, based on the contemporary sources, was that elements of the Anatolikon were the first to flee, and so Leo, to avoid a rout, gave the order to withdraw, and indeed managed to retreat in good order, saving his wing from being mown down. Whereas, Michael's troops broke immediately and fled. Crum was shocked at what he was seeing and hesitated before ordering a pursuit which resulted in the capture of the Eastern Roman baggage train and the slaughter of many fleeing soldiers. But the army was not totally annihilated. 
This would explain why not only most of Leo's troops survived the Battle of Versinicia, but also why he was chosen to take command as Michael I returned to Constantinople. Although the actual loss of life was much lower than the other Byzantine disaster at Pliska, the defeat at the Battle of Versinicia swung the war in Crum's favour and left Thrace open to conquest. Michael I rushed back to Constantinople, twice attempting to abdicate, first to Leo the Armenian, then to his wife and his ministers. Leo the Armenian, who had been left in command of the remaining army, was proclaimed emperor by them. On the 12th of July, 813, they marched to Constantinople. Michael I abdicated and was exiled to a monastery, along with his sons, who were all castrated to prevent them from claiming the throne. Michael I Rangabi was an incompetent, dithering emperor who ruled through other people's suggestions, devoid of any will of his own. He instigated a pointless persecution and catastrophically failed to stop the Bulgars, losing most of Thrace, half his army, and his own throne. The one thing he was remembered for was his piety, and he resolved the Mokian Schism, a carryover from the equally inept and disastrous reign of Constantine VI. Fortunately, he was succeeded by Leo the Armenian, who had far greater success. And this has been Eastern Roman history.